So it's been an emotional week for the Iranian footballers and supporters at the World Cup in Qatar. Ahead of Monday's game against England, the team stayed silent during the national anthem as they offered their support to the protests which have swept the country since the death in police custody of Masa Amini. It's feared some of the players could face reprisals for their silence when they go home. And when Iran were back in action against Wales on Monday, some players mumbled their way through the anthem while the fans booed and jeered at the regime. So here to tell me some more about the protests, I'm pleased to welcome the political YouTuber and commentator, Maya Tusi. Thank you very much for joining me today. So this is real bravery, isn't it? I mean, we talk about the various protests, taking the knee, rainbow flags, that kind of thing that footballers here do. But there's something really at stake when Iranian players refuse to sing the national anthem, isn't there? Yes, absolutely. And it goes beyond that, which is quite interesting, because whilst it's absolutely brave, as you mentioned, um, obviously they, they will be facing consequences or their families in Iran. So when, during the first game they didn't sing the national anthem, absolutely brave. But for the Iranians in Iran, as a culture, they're not into virtual signaling. And for them, while they still acknowledge that that's brave, they actually said to the, to, about the players, you don't need to do that. You shouldn't have gone to be, to, to be in a position to not sing the national anthem. So for them, even that was um, too gimmicky. But, um, but of course, the second game, they, they were forced. But is there a unanimity on that point? I mean, I would have thought yep. some of the protesters in Iran at the moment would be quite happy with any kind of support on the international stage. But that, that's interesting, because uh, obviously, um, from my, my position was initially, I was told, well, maybe we should just boycott it. Or the Iranian players should boycott the whole World Cup. But yes. then I realised, actually, no. Um, even though the second game, there were forces like a mumble the national anthem, the way I see it now, while some Iranians in Iran are angry that their players are still playing while people are getting killed, in fact, the longer they stay in the World Cup, the more attention they're going to actually draw. Well, yeah, I mean, we're talking about it right now. Yeah, I mean, exactly. so just to give us an update on the Iranian protest. So obviously there was the death in custody of this young woman mm -hmm. by the morality police, yep. the, 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 the group that called themselves the morality police because she wasn't wearing the hijab mm -hmm. properly or the covering properly. And this has led to this huge, uh, well, revolution, mm -hmm. really. Mm -hmm. And it's gained momentum in a way that previous attempts at these kind of things haven't, you know. Uh, you, you've got now lots of men are involved, lots of people are against the regime, they're very open, they're not afraid. I mean, you see a lot of these women talking online about how they're not afraid anymore. They've seen their friends killed and beaten, mm. but they really want to see this done. Are you, do you think this is something that might actually lead ultimately to regime change? It's not just that they're not afraid, they've actually lost the fear completely, which is quite abnormal for any human. Yes. Because we always have fear in our blood. And so th this Masa Amini, 22-year-old who was killed, um, th this kind of was a spark for something that's already started. This, this uprising, essentially, the movement started in 2017. Mm. And then it was a, what I call it, a cost of living revolution. Uh, it wasn't really political. And then 2019 got bigger. Then COVID happened. There was a bit of a pause. Uh, so essentially, subconsciously, the nation was waiting for a any excuse, a, a spark. Yes. Uh, so when Mass I mean, died, it wasn't like plans. Oh, well, she died. Let's just take advantage of um, her death. No, it wasn't that. It was just so organic. It felt like an eruption of emotion. And, yeah. and you know, the, the people are... It's interesting that this has come from a, a, a feminist background because mm -hmm. women are sick of... Uh, having to cover their faces, their hair, which they didn't have to do before the yeah. uh, the, Iran the Iranian revolution. This was this was this is a relatively new thing, and people say it's just a cultural difference. Well, yeah. no, Iran doesn't have this history. No, and and right now, literally all classes, all ages, and all genders, everyone's out. Yeah, uh, but it's led by a younger generation, and by younger generation, I'm talking generation Z, like the kids. Yes, um, but the, the interesting thing about them is that one. The, the, the Persian culture, but well, all Iranians, from Persians to Kurds and Turkish, um, they, they have this coincidental similarity with the Anglo-Saxon kind of mentality, which is, they, they don't really, they do symbolism, but not really virtual signals. They're not woke. So all this stuff that you see that, you know, to protect um, women, yes. it's not for some sort of third wave feminism, the kind of nonsense. They don't want to be affiliated with any of the kind of globalist movements. But the reality is that some of the chance is that, uh, while well, they're all out, but the, the younger kids say, um, to the, the Shah, the previous Shah, we're sorry, we're sorry. And to, to his son, the crown prince in exile, come back, come back. And it's not like that, you know, they all definitely want the king back. They're just, it's, it's more of a kind of asking for forgiveness that we made a mistake. They actually say that our parents made a mistake, we will fix it. Well, I mean, you see a lot of young women dancing, which is against yep. the law, burning yep. uh, their veils. I mean, these kind of incredibly, I mean, that's, again, real bravery. But I spoke to um, two Iranian women 
on this programme who were talking about how they feel that really they're being let down by feminists in the West. Mm -hmm. Feminists who often say, turn a blind eye, shall we say, mm -hmm. uh, or even sometimes have argued, as has been argued in publications like The Guardian, that wearing the veil is empowering. Yeah. Well, it's very easy to say, isn't it, if it's a choice. Not so easy to say if you're beaten with sticks for not doing so. This is why when this Iranian revolution is completed, and it will happen, it's just a matter of timing, it, it, it's gone too deep to be um, crushed. No one's going to like start shaking hands, say, like, go home, everything's fine now. Yeah. Um, this could actually, whilst it's going to be very bloody, unfortunately, but this could be quite bright for the future, and actually for the West, because yes. uh, the, the Iranian, whether it's the women, when it comes to fighting for individual liberty and self-determination, or any other social cause, they could lead the movement, the wave, against the, the Western liberals to show, for example, because right now the reason the liberal feminists are not really saying anything is because it's awkward. It's politically incorrect. They think that they might offend some random male Muslim in the West that, oh, well, what, what, what do you do? Can, so, can I support but, this Iranian woman? But why would Western liberals always stand up for the most reactionary, ultra-conservative elements within Islam? Why not stand up for the, the you know, gay Muslims, female Muslims? Yeah. You know, why not stand up for the oppressed? They don't see it that way, They're, because... Uh, uh, again, psychologically, the overall um, kind of uh, philosophical leftists, they just see um, underdogs. They just, it's a difference between punching down and punching up. So for them, when it comes to a, again, like a, a Muslim man from the Middle East, but they don't see them the ones who are there. They, want, they, they see the ones who are here. They call them migrants or refugees, and they, they are underdogs. So they basically turn a blind eye when it comes to any, all the other stuff that they have, any, if, they, if that person has you know, sexist views or racist views or homophobic views, they don't see it as priority because they see it as, it's not necessarily enemy of an enemy of a friend, but a similar concept because they say, well, they're white conservatives in the West. They don't like this migrant. So, uh, but they think that, obviously, it's not true. And they say, so we're going to have to back them. So you end up with the <laughs> sanctification of, of what they perceive to be marginalised groups, exactly. even though within those marginalised groups you can have these incredibly oppressive forces. Yes, and, and, and back in the home countries, they are the conservatives. As I said. Yes, exactly. So it's like the Taliban. So and, and if, if someone, if literally a, a, a Taliban member um, over the last decade or so had come here, which they had, they would see them as marginalised. Oh, we'll, we'll cuddle you. But now, of course, they're in Afghanistan leading. Yes. Uh, so now it's time for the, the Liberals to actually criticise the Taliban. They're not doing it, they're not supporting it, but they're basically just saying, well, it's probably best to just not say anything. Well, quite selective, aren't they? So, yeah. what, just bring it back to the football. Do you think that there will be potential repercussions for these players? Like, you've mentioned that, you know, some people back in Iran are not necessarily happy about their tactics. Yeah. Um, but there is a, an authentic risk from the regime for behaving this way, isn't there? Or do you, do you think they will be OK? I think that <laughs> they might get into trouble with the actual people. <laughs> uh, really? Uh, the, the, because uh, p people in Iran um, still, again, it's a uh, general kind of stereotype. Their per perception is that you're not brave enough because yeah. uh, Iranian footballers and f um, former footballers have been arrested in Iran uh, because they've been more vocal. Yes. And uh, so like, a couple of their, their football legends in Iran have been like, basically arrested. But then they say, well, why, why weren't you brave enough not to go to Qatar? Why are you following the orders, basically? Yeah. Um, but but, but I, th I think they're not going to be able to completely go after every single person. Like in terms of celebrities and big names, they have arrested a couple of celebrities, sometimes they um, free them, because yes. when it's too big, you'll create a new martyr. So they don't want to do that, but it's too late. They've completely lost control at this point. Do, OK. Well, do you feel, just the final question, do you feel that, you know, we've seen some Iranian women in the stands at Qatar with their, yeah. uh, their placards and their signs, and it feels a bit like they're putting people to shame. Harry Kane here says he won't uh, wear a rainbow flag because yeah. he doesn't want to get a yellow card. Yeah. Well, they're risking it. The women are risking a whole lot more. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it was funny, there were a couple of clips where the um, Iranian fans were actually <coughs> laughing at uh, some of the... The, the armbands and the, the symbols that the, some of the kind of Westerners, like English fans or English players, were doing. They're saying, well, what are you fighting about? And it, 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 for them, these fights are trivial. But for them, say, well, if you want to be in favor of any fight, any cause, support us. We just want freedom. We just want to live. And, and it's not yes. really virtual signaling, basically. Very, very interesting. Maya Tusi, thank you very much indeed.